So we're going to do just a bunch of extra normal distribution problems. So first one, if the SAT scores are approximately normal with a mean of 126, and as I do this, I'm always writing down, okay, what are they telling me? When normal, the mean is 1026, and a standard deviation is 209. So sigma is 209. What proportion of all students have scores greater than or equal to 820? So when it says proportion, that's just kind of like the same thing as saying what percentage are you making the best probability. So we're looking basically for the probability that we would get a score greater than 820. Or that tells us the same thing as the proportion of students that have a score greater than 820. Oh, greater than or equal to. Okay. So anytime you're doing this, you always have to standardize. Right? So everything we do... Probability instead of x, you have to do x minus mu over sigma. And so then we'll do this 820 minus our mean of 1026 over our standard deviation of 209. Now when you do x minus mu over sigma, that turns it into a z or your standard normal distribution. So z is greater than or equal to negative 0.99. Now at this point, you can kind of, you know, Use the official notation. I prefer to just draw a picture. So z of negative 0.99 would be here. I'm looking for the probability that you're greater than that. So going to the right. Okay, so I'm looking for the area to the right. If I go to my table and I look up negative 0.99, let's see. Here's my negative 0.9, and I go across the 9 column. It looks like 0.1611. So this area is 0 0.1611, but we wanted the area to the right. How do you find that? It's 1 minus 0 0.1611, which gives me 0 0.8389. Now notice, I can do all that without any fancy notation and all the symbols of the bookcases. Then I'll go ahead and I'm going to write these down just so we get used to it. So because we're looking for the probability to the right or greater than, we know we have to use the Compton rule, or it's 1 minus the CDF of point negative 0.99 or the CDF at negative 0.99 which was just 1 minus 0 0.1611 so 0 0.8389 okay and what does this mean to us I like to end these in a sentence so about 84 percent of students score at least 820 on the SAT. Our next example, now the NCAA considers students to be partial qualifiers for athletic scholarships if their SAT score is between 720 and 820. If the SAT scores are approximately normal with mean, that's mu equals 1026 and standard deviation equals 209, what proportion of all students would be partial qualifiers? They said they're partial qualifiers if you're between 720 and 820. So we're looking for the probability that x is between 720 and 820. What this means is I have to change both of those into z values. I have to standardize both of them. And so I'm going to go through every single thing and minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So 720 minus 1026 divided by 209 would be less than or equal to, we'll just say x minus mu over sigma to keep it all formal. And then we do 820 minus the mean of 1026 over standard deviation of 209. So this is the probability that we have negative 1.46 is less than or equal to z is less than or equal to negative 0.99. Now again, you can try to memorize everything or you can draw pictures. So here's negative 1.46, here's negative 0.99, and I'm looking for the area in between. So how do you find areas in between? You always subtract. You look up the bigger one, there's a bigger number, so negative 0.99, and you look up the smaller number, and you subtract them. So the negative 0.99, we don't need to look that up again. We already did. That's 0.1611. So that's like the area from 
point negative point nine nine all the way over to point one six one one. But we didn't want it all the way over and we want to stop here. So let's look up what this area was and we'll subtract it out. So we'll look up negative one point four six. So negative one point four six one two three four five six. Looks like we're at point oh seven two one. So this was point oh seven two one. So we have point one six one one minus point oh seven two one equals 0.0890. So really, those two values are between the 7th percentile, so 7% and 16%. So you're a partial qualifier if you're between the 7th and 16th percentile. Let's write ourselves a note. So 8.9% of all students would be partial qualifiers. or you have to be between the 7th and 16th percentiles. Okay, I get 7th percentile by saying that was 0.07 to the left and 16th percentile because they're 16% to the left. So the partial qualifiers aren't very high on these actual scores. And then we'll skip ahead a couple examples. So skip two pages ahead to our I-step scores. So there are many more uses and for the normal distribution besides SAT scores and test scores, but these are just very easy examples I'll start you off with. Okay, so let's consider the I-step scores, which are approximately normal, with a mean of 572 and standardization of 51. And it asks us how low of a score is needed to be in the bottom 25% of students to take this exam. So we've switched gears from what we did on our last example. Now we say we want to be in the bottom 25%. And we're wondering what x value makes this possible. So before you can figure out what x value makes that possible, you have to work backwards. So we'll start with, okay, this is 0.25 to the left. Let's find our z value first. Okay, so first we find z value. So what we do here is we have to go to our table and find what z value has 0.25 area to the left. So we're looking in the middle here for 0.25. That's a 0.2420. That's pretty close. 0.25. It looks like we're in between these two numbers. There's different ways you can do this. You can pick the average. I usually just pick whichever one's closer. So I think this 0.2514 is just a little bit closer. So that would be at negative 0.67. So negative 0.67. So z equals negative 0.67 using the table. So if z equals negative 0.67, what is x? Let's back up just a sec and look at our official notation. How did we find z? If you're looking for official notation so you can match what you see in the answer key in the book, instead of just drawing pictures, you use what's called the inverse CDF, it's saying just basically look at the probabilities to find and find the z value where you use the CDF backwards of 0.25 and we got negative 0.67. Okay, so Right, that was a detour. So coming back up, so if z equals negative 0.67, now what is x? Well, how would you find this? You know that z is always equal to x minus mu over sigma. So let's plug in what we know. We know z is negative 0.67. We don't know what x is, but we know our mean is 572, and sigma is 51, and now we'll just solve for x. So we'll multiply by 0.51, add 572, and x is going to be, let's see, negative 0.67 times 51 plus 572 gives me 537.83. So to be in the bottom 25%, you have to score at least 537. And I guess I, I said that wrong because you're just used to trying to score high in exams. If you want to be in the bottom 25%, you want to score less than 537. Okay, and then we're going to skip ahead again. 
Okay, so we're going to get into section 5.2, okay, which basically tells us, again, our rules for our linear combinations. Now these go back to there, the exact same rules that we used back in chapter 2. The only difference is it tells us if you add or subtract numbers or multiply by numbers, you still have a normal distribution. And if you add two random variables that are normal, you still have a normal distribution. And we have our formula for averages. Okay, so let's try this out on the animal shelter problem 147. So an animal shelter has a special facility for sick animals. Suppose there are three cats, two dogs, and they each have either cat flu or dog flu. X is going to be our duration of cat flu in hours. Y is the duration of dog flu in hours. And it tells us X is normally distributed with a mean of 36 and a variance of 9. Let's make ourselves our notes. So our cats are normal. Mu equals 36. And notice that's our variance, or sigma squared, equals 9. Okay. And if sigma squared equals 9, then sigma would just be what? 3 and square root of 9. And dogs are normal. And they have a mean of 41, and their variance is 6.25, which means that sigma is the square root of 6.25, or 2.5. Okay, now that we've done all that, let's see, what is the distribution of W, which is the total number of pet days spent in the infirmary? So first of all, how would we find W? It said there's three cats and two dogs, and we're looking for the total number, so you'd have to add them all up. So let's call it x1 for the first cat, plus x2 for the second cat, plus x3 for the third cat, plus y1 for the first dog, plus y2 for the second dog. Basically, you just have to add up those five animals. Let's see, and when it says what is the distribution, that means find the mean, the variance, or standard deviation, and also what the shape would be, or what kind of distribution we have. So to find the mean for all of that total, how do you find the mean for all of these, or when you add it together? What's the expected value of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus y1 plus y2? How did we do that? Didn't we just add each of their individual means? Just the expected value of x1 plus the expected value of x2 plus dot, dot, dot. So let's just add up all of their expected values. So for the cat, we had a 36. The second cat had a mean of 36. The third cat had, well, I guess an expected value of 36. One dog for 41, and another dog also 41. So that gives me 190 days. And the variance for W is equal to the variance of X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus y1 plus y2. So the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, let's see what we get then. So each of the cats had a variance of 9. So 9 plus 9 plus 9. And the dogs had a variance of 6.25. So we're at 39.5 days. Sorry, not days. These units are all in hours form. Okay, so we look at that then, and so we can say, okay, W is going to be distributed. It's still going to be normal because we said up above, if you add normal variables together, you still get a normal variable, which is pretty cool. So the mean is 190, the variance is 39.5. And that's how you would do that one. Now, part two, though, is slightly different. It says, what is the probability that the average time a cat, so we're talking about the average for cats, spends in the infirmary is more than 40 hours, so average of three cats. So we're talking about averages, so let's go back up to our previous page and look at our formulas for averages. Okay. So here's what we use for averages. The average is distributed normally with the same mean as what we started with, but you do your variance divided by n. So x bar is supposed to be distributed normally with mean and variance over n. 
So in our case, x bar is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 36, and our variance is going to be 9 over 3, because n is 3 for 3 cats. So we have 36 and 3 for our variance. Now that we know how x bar is distributed, it's pretty easy to find the probability, so we just go back to what we're using. So we're looking for the probability that x bar is greater than or equal to 40. So you still have to standardize. So we'll just do x bar minus the mean of x bar over standardization of x bar. Greater than or equal to, okay, so we'll do 40 minus the mean of x bar is, we said 36. The standard deviation would be the square root of our variance, so the square root of 3. So we're looking for the probability that z is greater than or equal to 2.31. Again, always draw a picture. We're looking for the area to the right. So go to your normal table. Look up 2.31. 2.31 would be here at 0.9896, but that's the area to the left, so we need to do 1 minus that, which is 0.0104. Officially, they would have said this is 1 minus the CDF of our 2.31, or 1 minus 0.9896, so 0.01. So only about a 1% chance that the average is more than 40 hours. 